It's awesome to see you greeting and fellowshipping and having a great time. Let's take our Bibles. Let's open to the book of Revelation. I am so excited to, to be looking forward to getting into this book and uh, been on vacation. Many of you know I've been on vacation uh, for a while and I, I've been uh, lis like listening into the live streaming and uh, I'm really glad we have live streaming. It's so awesome. And uh, so, so thankful for the pastors that we have that are just so solid teachers. Pastor Matthew, Pastor Sean just brought the word. And I just want to say thanks to them. You know, awesome, awesome. Um, it's just, it was so awesome to come back and everything just was running so smoothly, so well. That it was just, it's just a testimony to the leadership that, that, Pastor Matthew and Sean and others and the, the worship and the youth and every, it's just amazing and I'm just so, so thankful. But I've been really, really looking forward to coming back. I love vacation. I love the, the time off. I uh, love the family. I love being, it's just awesome. But there's just, I just, I love teaching the word of God and I'm just so thankful to be back and looking forward to the book of Revelation and looking forward to just, uh, you know, let's, let's just preach it through. I'm just excited to go verse by verse to Revelation. Amen. So let's pray. Lord, we do open the word in order to receive from your spirit that uses the word in our lives. And, and I look to the book of Revelation and understand, God, that you, you would give a, a special blessing to those who would, who would read this and to take it to heart. And so, God, that's, that's what we want to do. We want to do far more than just some kind of intellectual study. We want to have an experience through the Word of God. And we know that you send forth your Word by your Spirit in order to do that very thing in our lives. You want to stir us up, and you use the Word to do it. So, Lord, stir us up tonight and show us your heart after us. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, the revelation is not plural. I mentioned some of the introduction uh, to this over the weekend at the weekend services. So just kind of repeat a little bit of, of the introduction just in case you uh, weren't at the weekend services. Uh, the, the, the title of the book is a great place to start, which is The Revelation, not Revelations, but singular. And uh, the, the translation of the Greek here is important. Uh, it's a word that all of you would know, which is the word apocalypse. But the word apocalypse has kind of changed meaning uh, in, in our usage because we use the word apocalypse um, sort of as, well, you know what it means, right, in English, apocalyptic, cataclysmic, earth-shaking, uh, you know, huge events like that. That's not at all what it means in the Greek. It's not its original meaning. Um, but it's, it's been changed, right? The meanings of words change over time. For, I was just reading an article about, um, about the hurricane Irma that's, that's right now. Just uh, pray for everyone in that part of the world because it is like record-breaking hurricane forces that are just, and it describes it as apocalyptic, right? The hurricane is apocalyptic. And so they're using the modern idea of what it means, right? But it's original in, in English or in uh, Greek is simple. It's the unveiling, the revealing. And uh, what does it unveil? What does it reveal? It reveals Jesus Christ. So it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It reveals Jesus in the latter days. Okay, so we, we want to start with that understanding. Jesus is the center of this book. Not cataclysmic apocalyptic events. It was not written to, to instill fear. It was written to instill faith, to have encouragement that you would understand that your Lord is the ruler of the kings of the earth. And your faith is, is the substance of your faith is that understanding that God rules over the nations. And so this book should, should really encourage you and should really strengthen you and to give you that hope to understand that though the world has before it 
cataclysmic events, as the wrath of God will be poured out on the world, we understand that for the church, those who, who take hold of God in their lives, that foundation of Jesus Christ is a sure foundation. Even though the, the earth may change, he is the rock on which we stand. And so there is that strength that we have uh, through the understanding of this revelation, this prophecy, this revealing of Jesus Christ. Also, I mentioned that there's different approaches, different ways that um, Bible scholars have, have looked at it. And uh, mentioned, for example, that there's kind of the spiritual lizing, the spiritualizing of the book. They, that approach does not believe that any of these things are actual events, that all of these are just spiritual lessons. And the spiritual analogies are you know, brought out of it, and it's, it doesn't make any sense to me, frankly. <laughs> but that's one of the approaches. And I think they do that primarily because they, they can't make sense of it, and so it's easier to spiritualize it. Uh, another approach is the preterist view, which believes or teaches that all of the events mentioned are already past, fulfilled in 70 AD when Rome destroyed Jerusalem. So that preterist view has uh, this view that it's, it's already passed. Here's the problem. Now, there's a lot of problems with that view. The biggest problem with that view is that the book was written in probably 95, 96 AD, but Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. So how can it be prophecy if it was already happened? So there's a problem there. Uh, as you can believe or understand, I don't take hold of any of those approaches. The other is the historicist view, which believes that it's all been fulfilled, but they spread it out all through the history of the church. And they kind of take the history of the church uh, and kind of put it in these segments of time, uh, having therefore all of the events fulfilled in a much larger time span. Uh, I don't believe that either. I think that that's a, a stretch, if you don't mind the pun. And um, that was a bad pun. You didn't even like it at all. Uh, but that's the historicist view. And then the other is the futurist view, which is the, the view I take because it's the right one. And okay, come on now, come on now. I was just making some joke here. Uh, but the futur futurist view believes it's a book of prophecy, right? It's prophetic of latter day events. So taking that view, then we weave together the prophecies of scripture that clearly are indicative of the latter days. Okay, so we're gonna look at Daniel. As we go through this, we're gonna, we're gonna do a Bible study. We're gonna do a lot of weaving together of these, these prophetic places. Daniel, Ezekiel, Zephaniah, Zechariah, uh, and, uh, and on and on, right? They, there are ample places for us. Matthew 24, Matthew 25, the, Paul's writings to the church at Thessalonica, and on and on, they, they come together beautifully in the book of Revelation. So we are going to see this as the eschatology, the latter day events, uh, and see it from that futurist view. That's our perspective on it. Um, we're gonna look also at modern day events. We are seeing the world changing before our eyes. Nations are, are changing, world forces are changing. And there is spiritual forces of wickedness that are on the move. Does, does anybody in their spirit sense that there are spiritual forces of wickedness on the move in the world today and that there is a storm cloud on the horizon? And therefore, having said that, what we want to do, the best that we can, we want to take a look at what's happening in the nations and connect them to the prophetic verses of Scripture. Particularly, we're going to look at the Middle East, because that's where a lot of these events uh, are centered, particularly Israel and Jerusalem. Uh, and so we're going to look at that in detail. And uh, it's very important for us to, to really see the current events of the world through the lens of scripture. And also, I want to, uh, if as we do this, I want to weave in some of the history of modern day Israel, because I am convinced, and I mentioned this over the weekend and it bears repeating, I, I'm convinced that Israel is still very significant to God spiritually as a nation. Not just geopolitically because of its, uh, you know, its advantages in that particular location. Uh, that's all fine and good. 
But I'm speaking about the, the spiritual significance that God is not finished with Israel yet. The scripture says and promises in the book of Romans that all Israel will be saved. Now, we're going to kind of look at that some tonight because it jumps right into that in chapter one. But I want to mention that because as I mentioned over the weekend, there is a branch of Christian doctrine called replacement theology, which believes that Israel is no longer significant uh, spiritually, that they're just like any other nation. They just happen to be in that particular place. They're not significant. I don't believe that at all. They believe that the promises made to Israel in the past have been replaced by the promises given to the church, that the church is now the significant spiritual Israel. I just do not believe that. I believe that the, the promises made to Israel are sure and eternal, and that God will, through the return of Jesus Christ, bring forth their Messiah. Now, we're going to look at that, because it jumps right into this. And, and he will bring forth their Messiah. Now, when Jesus uh, came the first time, the first advent of Jesus, they did not recognize him. And we're going to look at that tonight, too. Uh, they did not see him or recognize him as the Messiah. Some did, but the nation as a, as a nation did not. But when he returns at the end of the age, at the end of the eschaton, they will see him whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one would mourn for an only son. Why would they mourn for him? Because it was him whom they pierced. And they, rec they would then recognize it was him all those years ago. And we missed the opportunity to have our Messiah. And so therefore, they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. But the scripture tells us that he will pour out on them the spirit of grace and the spirit of supplication. And thus, all Israel will be saved as the grace of the blood of Jesus Christ, which forgives their sin, will be poured out on the people of Israel who receive Jesus Christ as their Messiah whom they recognize now as the one who paid the penalty for their sin in the fulfillment of the scriptures. All right, I'm laying a lot of stuff here, but we're going to look at it as we go through the book of Revelation. I promise to not give you the whole thing in one introduction. But bear with me. Our Wednesday services, by the way, are really critical. We're going to dive into uh, segments as we go through the weekend services. But Wednesdays, that's our verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We just, that's the glue that connects it all together. So Wednesday service is particularly important as we go through Revelation. But it's, of course, important for every book we do. But let's jump into it. Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ. So it is the revealing of Jesus. What does the word Christ mean? The Messiah. Israel's Messiah. The revelation of Jesus, the Messiah, which God gave to him. So who, who gave this to Jesus? God the Father. In order to show to his bondservants, now that's extended therefore to us, the things which must shortly take place. And the word shortly there uh, is, 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 the idea is quickly. Tachos, like tachometer. It'll be quickly. And he sent and he communicated it or signified it by his angel to his bondservant John. Um, by the way, the, the translation of the word bondservant, the idea of bondservant here is actually a, a Hebrew idea. Um, they're using a, a, a there's a Greek word doulos behind it, and they're trying to translate it as a Hebrew idea because it's a difficult word, uh, but it has tremendous depth, and we could do a whole study on this word because it's great significance. It's not the idea of slave. That's why they didn't put slave there. Bondservant is, is different. It, it's like the idea of someone who is a servant willingly. It's like, I want to be indentured to you. I want to serve you, Lord. I, I want you to know, Lord, that I am yours. You are my captain. You are my commander. You, you can direct my life. I, I want you to know, Lord, that my allegiance is under you. You have authority in my life. That's the kind of relationship that we should voluntarily have with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Okay, so there's a lot behind this word, and the, they, they use the Hebrew understanding of bondservant because in the, in the Hebrew uh, days of the law, a, a servant or a person could become a slave or a servant voluntarily, sometimes to get out of debt, uh, uh, but they were released from it by the law every seven years. There was a, there's a release, which is interesting. But if a person said, I don't want to be released, I want, I want to serve. I love, I love who I serve. I love him. I don't want to leave. I love this relationship. Then he could become a bond servant where they, okay, this is a little graphic here, but this is what they do. So they would take uh, an awl and they would punch a hole in the ear. So he'd put his ear against a fence post and then they'd take a big old awl and then a a chunk, a big chunk out of his ear, and then they put gauges in it so that it would, okay, just kidding about that. <laughs> okay, just kidding about the gauges thing, okay. But, but that, would, that would signify that to, to all, I am like permanently, I'm like permanently a servant because I want to, because I love him and I want to serve. I want this relationship to continue. He's a wonderful, he's a wonderful Lord and I want this to continue. That's the same idea we should have with the Lord. Here, Lord, Punch the all in my ear. Because I, not physically, right? It's a spiritual idea. That I want you to know, I want your authority over my life. Do you welcome his authority? See, this is a key to that relationship. That's why he makes it twice. He mentions it twice in just these very, this very first verse. And he says, he communicated this revelation, this unveiling, this revealing, to his bondservant, John. Now, when you think of the idea of unveiling, I mentioned this over the weekend, it's kind of like the idea of a statue, a sculpture that's got a, a, a cover drape over it, you know, and then uh, the day of the great revealing, the great unveiling, uh, a, a rope or something is attached to it and it's pulled back and everybody goes, whoa, that's amazing. It was previously hidden and now revealed. So the idea is that these things which were there, but previously uh, not known, are now being given, revealed to the bondservants so that they might know the things which must shortly take place. God wants you to know the things that will quickly take place. Verse 2. This John bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. So John is significant. He is the last of the living uh, apostles, last of those who saw the risen Lord, walked with him, saw the miracles, the authority, the healing of the blind, the casting out of demons, the confrontation with the, the, the leaders of Israel, the casting uh, of his authority upon them when he commanded the wind and the waves, all of this, he saw all of it. So he's very, very significant in the church. He's bore witness to it all. Then he says this great blessing, blessed is he, and this is the promise that we are looking forward to. There's a special blessing promised in verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it for the time is near. Okay, now I mentioned this before. The idea here, back in those days, that they didn't have Bibles like you and I do. So one person who had this letter uh, which was copied and sent to the other churches. One person, the leader, would read it, and then the church would, with all attentive ears, hear it. So he who reads is blessed. They who hear are blessed. And it says, heed the things. Now, the word heed in the Greek is the idea of, of keeping. In other words, you, you hear these things and you take hold of these things and you keep them. You hold on to them and you hold them to your, your, your heart. You hold them into your soul. And those things, when you hold on to those things in your soul, that's when they become a blessing to you. See, uh, we, are, we are transformed because of what is put into our soul. The treasures of the soul. A man speaketh according to the treasures that are in his heart. 
Well, where do you get treasures into your heart? Well, the word of God is that treasure, right? When you take the word and you don't just hear it, but you hold it, you take hold of it and then you hold it into your soul. It becomes like precious to you. You write it upon your soul. It becomes that blessing. See, here's why, here's why. Because this is not just an education. The word of God is alive. It's living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's sent by God with power to transform your life. God will bless you if you take hold of his word. Do you believe it? See, take hold of his word. I tell you, when I, when I was in Bible uh, college, I was memorizing so many things and, and, and would memorize you know, whole sections of scripture. And I tell you what, I, I, I saw scripture in a completely different way. When you start taking the hold of scripture and you put it in your heart, it starts to bless you in a very powerful, powerful way. Like when, when I'm gonna teach a section of scripture, uh, I wanna really have that scripture in my heart. I will read it over and over and over and over and over because I want that word written on my soul. In order to teach it, in order to explain it, I want it to come forth powerfully. Well, I want God to write it on my heart powerfully so I can speak it powerfully. Can you imagine, right, the blessing that God would have for the church when the church takes that word and, and just holds it onto their soul? Even more so, this book, because of its, of its power to prepare the believer for the events of the latter days. He's calling us to be alert. You watch, he says. Jesus said it several times. You watch and you be ready. You watch for the signs of the times. You watch for the aligning of nations. As you see the buds on the tree start to come forth, that is the indication that summer is going to be very near. That's like a sign of the time. When you see these events, you be on the alert. You be spiritually ready. And I want, I'm just praying that this church would become spiritually ready. Because I tell you what, we are on the, like the doorstep. We, do you sense that there's like a nearness to the cataclysmic events that are going to come on the world, but the strength of the church is its faith that abides beyond it. Amen? So we continue. Verse four, now John is writing this, he received it, is writing this to the seven churches that are in Asia. There were a lot more than seven churches. But these seven churches are like representative of all the churches. The number seven is significant. And, and you know, a lot of people get all weirded out when it comes to numerology and scripture. And you can get really far out there with numerology. You've probably read some of that weird stuff. Nevertheless, there are numbers that are significant in the scriptures. Seven is one of those. Um, I, I mean, I could, I could do a whole sermon just on the number seven. Because there's so much significance to the number seven. On the seven days of creation, God rested on the seventh day. Um, how many... How many times did Jesus say that one should forgive? Remember when Peter came to him, how many times, you know, should my brother sin against me and I, and I forgive him? Three times? When he said it, he thought he was being magnanimously generous. Like three times? No, I say to you, or seven times, rather, I say to you 70 times seven. How many is that? Like 490. Like that's an interesting number there. 490. When you look at the prophecy of Daniel and he sets forth the number that brings forth the Messiah, what's the number? 70 times 7. It's well, like that's an interesting coinkadink. There's that's interesting. Is there such thing as a spiritual coincidence? There is a great significance to what he's saying. So it represents the churches that are in Asia, represent the churches, seven being the number of completion. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Grace and peace. Now he's writing to these churches that are going to be enduring, uh, uh, going through, they're already suffering because of the emperor Domitian, bringing forth an empire-wide persecution. And so this is going to encourage the church tremendously, but he writes to them grace and peace. Can you have peace in the midst of trouble? Can you have peace in the midst of turbulence, 
of, of, of all the challenges and difficulties of life? Can you have peace in that? Yeah, if God sends you his peace, you can. If it's God's peace in you because of your faith that God orders the steps of the righteous, you can. And so he's telling you, I want you to have grace and I want you to have peace, but it's coming from him who is and who was and who is to come. And that is a picture of the eternal nature of God, right? That is one of the beautiful aspects of God. He is eternal. Who is and who was and who is to come? The Almighty. The eternal nature of God. We know, of course, that God is outside of time. Time itself is a creation, right? The time is intricately knitted into the fabric of space, Space, time, it's relative, right? It's all a creation. God stands outside of that. And there's a beautiful picture of the eternal God. If, God. if God came into being, then he's not God. I remember speak. I was witnessing to a fellow one time. And uh, in order to strike up a conversation, I asked him what he thought. Like, well, what do you think about God? Where, where, do, where do you think he came from? And, and he came up with some, you know, strange thing. He's the evolving of the cosmic dust of the universe. And, uh, like, I thought he was joking. Like, really? Yeah. He's like, he's the evolving of the cosmic dust of the universe. Well, how'd you come up with this? Well, I just think it. Well, I, I personally think we need a little more authority than I think this. And, but, but it led to an opportunity. Because I said, what do you think? And he, he told me. And then he said, well, what do you think? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. I, wow, that's, let me think about that. And, but it was an opportunity, right? So I began to explain to him. He said, where do you think God came from? And I said, if God came from anywhere, he's not God. God has always been he is the eternal one who is and who was and always will be. It's the, I love that nature of God, right? And so we have, we have set our, our heart, our foundation on who God is. He reveals himself to us through Jesus Christ. And Jesus also, in the same way, indicated that he was eternal like his father. And I'll tell you what, if you ever want to have a really interesting uh, read you got to read uh, John 8. I mean, John 8 is a fascinating read. Uh, okay, okay, yeah, good idea. Let's go there. Uh, because it is an amazing description conversation between Jesus and these Jewish leaders. And what comes out of it is the revelation of who Jesus is in eternity. Okay, so they get into this conversation. This, this, maybe we could say, um, confrontation. Let's start in verse 38. I'll, it's kind of a long read here, but it's fascinating. Jesus says, I speak the things which I have seen with my Father. Now, this is important because God reveals to Jesus and sends forth Jesus to reveal God's nature. So, when, when they said, show us the Father, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. So he says, I speak the things I've seen from my Father, therefore you also do the things which you have heard from your Father. They answered and said to him, Abraham's our Father. Jesus said, if Abraham, if you are Abraham's children, then do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham didn't do this. So you were doing the deeds of your father. Earlier he had told them that their father was the devil, the liar. You are doing the deeds of your father. Just to show you how upset they were, they said to him, hey, we were not the ones born in fornication. Do you get what they just said there? They, do you? Do you realize what they just said of Jesus? This is, this is like an insult of insults. They are trying to, to insult him by calling, I'm not going to repeat it. We're not the ones born of fornication. We have one father, God. 
Jesus says, hey, if God were your father, if God were your father, you would love me. Because I proceeded forth and have come from God. And I have not even come in my own initiative. He sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It's because you cannot hear my word. Because you are of your father, the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning. And he does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. And whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. He is a liar and he's the father of lies. I get the sense that Jesus was hot. I, I don't know. I'm just thinking he's hot. Because what did they just say to him? And so he comes back with just the piercing truth. You are of your father, the devil. And verse 45, because I speak the truth, you don't believe me. Which of you convicts me of a sin? If I speak truth, why don't you believe me? He who is of God, okay, listen to this verse. He who is of God hears the words of God. And for this reason, you don't hear them because you're not of God. You know, there's a lot to get out of this conversation because it really speaks to every one of us. Those who are of the truth, they hear the truth. Those who are of God hear the words of God. The Jews answered and said, do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan? Now that, that kind of passes over, over a lot of people. That was a deep insult. That was on par with the son of fornication. Did we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and you've got a demon? Jesus answered, I don't have a demon, but I honor my father. I honor my father, and you dishonor me. I don't seek my own glory, but there is one who seeks it and judges. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall, keeps my word, he shall never see death. The Jews responded, now we know you've got a demon. Abraham died, prophets died, and you say, anyone who keeps my word, he shall never taste of death. Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. You have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say that I don't know him, then I would be a liar like you are. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham, re okay, verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. The Jews therefore said to him, you're not even 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus responded, truly, truly, I say to you, now listen to this, before Abraham was born, I am. What is the name of God? I am. The great I am. Before Abraham was even born, I am. Therefore, they were done talking. They were finished with this conversation. And they picked up stones in order to throw them at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. That is a great conversation. And it reveals to us so much about Jesus Christ. Now, jump back to Revelation chapter 1. I promise we're going to make better speed than that. From him, verse 4, who is and who was and who was to come, from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Okay, what, are, what does it mean, the seven spirits who are before the throne? He just mentioned that he's writing to the seven churches. Now, he's not clear as to what he means by the seven spirits. Some believe that it's the sort of the sevenfold uh, nature of the Holy Spirit. Um, 
Uh, I'm of the mind that the, the, the churches have the principalities of angelic forces and an angel which resides over them, which he's going to describe in a little bit for us, the angels over the churches. And so the seven spirits who are before his throne write also, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. I love that powerful description of who Jesus is. The faithful witness. The word in Greek is the word martyr, which we uh, have kind of changed its meaning again. The, the word martyr today is someone who dies because of their testimony. But in those days, it meant someone who is so strong in their testimony, they're willing to die, right? So Jesus is like the faithful witness. He is the witness of who God is. God sent him forth to speak God's word, God's heart, to reveal God's nature. He is like the faithful witness. So when, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He speaks according to God's heart. By the way, we are called to be witnesses, right? I will send you forth from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth to be my witnesses. And I'll send you forth in power to be my witnesses. So we are also called because we are given forth the word to take to the world. We're like the light of the world. We are like witnesses also. And so in the, in the same way that God, through Jesus Christ, revealed himself, we, through our witness, should be a revealing of Jesus in how we live our lives. What did Jesus say? Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and they glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now that's the witness, right? We are called to live in such a way that people look at our lives and they say, ah, there, I can see God in that life. I can see God in your, I can see God in how you live. Wouldn't that be awesome? If people could say that. I see, I look at you. Now no one is saying, oh, we gotta be perfect. Okay, there's no such thing. But, but the testimony is that God is changing, that God is, is moving, that God is doing something. And so they see it. Reminds me of a funny story. So this uh, person gets pulled over by the police, and, and so the, the police officer comes and says, show me your driver's license and your registration, and, and uh, started asking all of these questions, like, whose car is this? And, and you know, how long have you had it? And, and all of this sort of sort of. And so person reveals, gives, it's my car, you know, and I've had this car. Da, da, da. So all these questions. So just a minute, I'll be back. He goes back to his car and after a few minutes, he comes back and, and okay, here's your registration and your driver's license. And, and the person says, can I, would you mind my asking, like, why, why are you asking all of those questions about, like, who owns his car? Why are we asking all those questions? And, and the police officer said, well, you see, I saw your bumper stickers and the what would Jesus do and the fish and everything. And when I was seeing you driving, I thought, surely somebody must have stolen that car. <laughs> wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be, <laughs> wouldn't it be awesome if, if maybe it'd be better not to wear a sticker if you're going to drive that way, but. But wouldn't it be awesome if someone saw how you forgave and they say, you know what? That's, that's what Jesus does. Or you extend grace to someone who doesn't deserve it. And you say, and they say, that, that's, that's grace. That's, that's what Jesus does. Or your kindness or your mercy or your, your help or your... your your patience, they, they, that's what Jesus does. It's like that witness. I just, to me, it's a powerful thought. Can you imagine the impact that the church can make when, the, when there's a, like a difference? People can see that there's a difference. God is on the move, right? He's transforming us. And, and let it be seen in the way we live our lives. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So, he continues, I love this description of Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. He has made us to be a kingdom. And priests, 
to his God and Father. I spent time on that this weekend, so we'll continue. To him be the glory and the dominion. The word dominion is authority. Forever and ever, amen. Behold, now he jumps right into it. He is coming with the clouds. This is prophetic that Jesus is going to return physically now, it says when he comes with the clouds, there's kind of some different schools of thought as to what that means. Now, remember when Jesus ascended, that he ascended in the clouds. And then there was an angel like, why do you appear? Why do you keep staring? He will return as he departed, as he ascended, he will return. So some look at that as say, literally, he will like come through the clouds. Others say, no, it's the cloud of witnesses because the, the return of Christ includes the, the armies of heaven, which include the believers who would come to the earth with him, which we're going to look at as we go through this. So that's one school of thought. He's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, which is an amazing thought to me, how every eye uh, would see him. And I think it and makes a lot of sense in regards to the way that the modern uh, a, a method that, that is available through technology that one event can be seen all around the world very fast. Even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, even so, amen. All right, verse seven, when it talks about those who pierced him, he's referring here to the Jews. Now, clearly it was the Romans that actually crucified him but it was through the, the Hebrew pressure onto Pontius Pilate that brought about his crucifixion. Now, I want to clarify a point because the, the, the church, particularly in the Middle Ages, blamed the Jews for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And a tremendous amount of persecution was brought against Jews and anti-Semitism. There's a lot of anti-Semitism that has arisen over the centuries due to the idea that the Jews are responsible for the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And these have taken up, these anti-Semitic people have taken up this, this, this vendetta by accusing the Jews of crucifying our Lord and Savior. Can I, just, can I just speak to that? Who crucified our Lord and Savior was every one of us. Because he died on the cross as a payment for every one of our sins. Jesus said, now please hear this part. Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. No man takes my life from me. I lay it down on my own accord. So who was responsible for the death of Christ? We were, and he was. I gave my life willingly for you. You receive it from the heart of which I gave it. I gave my life for you. Don't blame the Jews. There's no one to blame but the sins of the world which fall upon Jesus Christ on the cross of Golgotha. And understanding that, he's saying it for the reason of the fact that when they perceive him, when they see him, when he sets foot on the Mount of Olives and enters Jerusalem to the eastern gate and sets up Jerusalem as his throne, they will see him whom they have pierced, Zechariah 14. And they will mourn because they will recognize that it was him that they crucified all those years before. And then in chapter 13, it describes, and they say, why, what are those scars on your hands? Zechariah, read it sometime, it's amazing. What are those scars on your hands? It was when I was wounded in the house of my friends. How, how amazingly prophetic. They will see him, but they will receive him as their Messiah because he will pour out on them the spirit of grace and supplication. And we and the church, uh, rather the church and the Jews 
will become united together under the banner of Jesus Christ. The two will become one, and there is the blood of Jesus which covers all of us. And therefore, he's giving us this prophetic word, and all the earth will mourn over him, even so, amen, let it be. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus Christ, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's why he was there. He was exiled there because of the testimony and the word of God. And so Emperor Domitian felt very threatened by the church because they believed that Jesus was King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he was the living son of God. And he, of course, would have nothing of that because he insisted on calling Dominus et Deus, Master and God. It was very threatened. And so the, the greatest elder and statesman of the church was none other than John. He had him arrested, boiled in oil. He survived it. So he exiled him to the island of Patmos. And on Patmos, he receives this amazing revelation. And it says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice like the voice of a trumpet. And it said, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I turned and to see the voice that was speaking to me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. In the middle of the lampstands, there was one like the Son of Man, clothed in a robe, reaching to his feet. Girded across his breast was a golden girdle. And his head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. And his feet were like burnished bronze when it has been caused to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he laid his right hand upon me, and he said, Don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last, the living one. I was dead, and behold, I live forevermore. And I hold the keys of death and of Hades. Right therefore... The things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which shall take place after these things. Now, as for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, and the seven stars, these are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands, they are the seven churches. And so here is this amazing symbolic, this symbol of this description of the Son of Man. What do all of these things mean? Well, next Wednesday, <laughs> we're going to look at that. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. You thought I was kidding. No, I mean, Lord, thank you so much for your word. And we, we just want your word to speak powerfully through this book because it is the revealing of Jesus Christ. We want to see Jesus through this book in the powerful way in which you reveal him to us. We want our hearts to be ready. We want to be able to have the depth of understanding. We want to be transformed through it. So God, we look to you. Move in power through your word. Show us your heart after us. We want to be transformed. And church tonight, as, we, as we're praying before the Lord, I want to give this invitation. Because when we, when we look at this, this re revelation, it is the revealing of Jesus Christ whom God sent that we might be reconciled to God through him. And this, as we begin this significant, important study, I want to extend to you that invitation to have a relationship to Jesus Christ. It's a personal relationship he wants. He sent his son to go and seek after you. He sent his son to go knocking on the door of your heart because he wants relationship with you. You say, well, I'm a sinner. Of course you're a sinner.
And he knows that very well. But you, would you hear this part? That's why he sent Jesus. Because you're a sinner. That's why he sent him. He knows full well that you're a sinner. That's why you need Jesus. Because he's the hope of heaven. He's the forgiver of sin. He's the friend of sinners. And he welcomes you home. He went, God sent him to go and get you. To bring you back. To have a relationship with the Almighty. You are invited. He's knocking. He's seeking. He wants you to come home. Would you just, would you just receive Jesus in your heart? Would you open your heart to him? Just raise your hand. I just want to say yes and amen. I just want to agree with you in prayer. God bless anyone else. Just, just God bless you right there in the front, in the side, in the back, in the middle, on the far, far side. I see you way over there. Anyone else? Anyone else? In the middle? Anyone else? All the way back, and right there in the middle, there in the front, there. I see you there too. God bless you. God bless you. It's beautiful. I'll tell you what, the angels of heaven rejoice. Angels of heaven rejoice when a sinner comes home. And amen. Let's give the Lord, yeah, let's give the Lord praise. Let's all stand to our feet, man. Let's just stand to our feet and let the Spirit move upon us. Let the Spirit just move upon our soul because He he is the one who takes hold of us from the inside and transforms our soul and ignites us with His life and His love. Let's be transformed as we worship the Lord tonight. A thousand times I